thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Brexit, Data Protection, E-Privacy, and Cybersecurity Issues. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Joining us is Scott Giordano, VP of Data Protection at Spirian. Scott's a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience. Also joining us is Andre Bywater, partner at Quartery. Andre is a highly regarded commercial lawyer who also has over 20 years of experience. Welcome, Scott and Andre. Scott, please take it away. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And uh, Andre, welcome to our, our webcast here. Um, we're all very grateful to have you. Would you just tell us a little bit about your firm and what you do, and then let's dive right in into uh, Brexit. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much, Abby, as well. Thanks for inviting me. And this is obviously I'm, I'm returning back for another webinar, which is great. As, as Abby kindly mentioned, I'm a commercial lawyer based in London, but I specialize in compliance issues, particularly data protection. And as you can imagine, GDPR has been keeping me pretty busy for the last year or two. And as you can imagine, <laughs> Brexit is also doing the same, which is very much the sort of the themes of what I'm going to be talking about today. Scott, shall I just carry on, or is there anything else you wanted to say? I think that's a great summary. Why All right. We, why so we, if I can... We've got a lot of material, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Andre, and I will periodically uh, ask you some questions, but otherwise, take it away. Okay, thank you. So on the, on the, the first slide we've got there, it's the, you know, the general big question here is, well, what's going on concerning data protection and Brexit? As you can imagine, we are still in the throes of Brexit. We should have left the EU last Friday, but didn't. And the next big date will be Friday of next week, the 12th of April. So that's the sort of big one to keep in mind. And my slides were prepared before we left the EU, but I think most of what I've put in the slides still applies. And although some of my slides are quite wordy, I'm gonna be paraphrasing as much as possible so that this is a much more sort of natural sort of presentation and talk. And obviously great to hear some questions from you as possible. So if I can go on to the next slide. Here, I've just put up some words here from our data protection commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, who's Canadian. And uh, I like the way she very diplomatically puts, like everyone in the UK right now, we're following the twists and turns of the Brexit negotiations. Well, boy, are those twists and turns. Every single day, we have a different issue, different position, and so on. But despite all of that, data protection is certainly very high up there on the agenda for both the UK and the EU. And both sides have made much preparation for this for either, a, should we call it a smooth break, if we get the, this withdrawal agreement through the UK Parliament, or if we get a no deal. Although I think most of us are thinking that it looks like we're going to have a no deal by next Friday, the 12th of April, but let's see. And as she puts there in her statement there, obviously it's very important that um, in terms of sharing all types of data, including our customers' data, that's absolutely vital for all business supply chains to keep going. And as she puts there in the middle paragraph there, the situation we're in now is because the UK is an EU member state, one of the 28 member states, if this withdrawal agreement is approved, we'll basically have an interim period until the end of December 2020. So in a sense, it'll be business as usual, but there will be some changes until we get a longer term solution after that. But as I mentioned, and as it says in the third paragraph there, if unfortunately we get a no deal, I say unfortunately, some people want a no deal, but if that happens, then we are gonna have to put in additional measures concerning particularly data transfers. And that's the sort of key word I have here on this first part of the, the, the presentation. It's data transfers is the issue we really need to focus on, but it's not the only issue. So if I can go on to the next slide, perhaps the first question here is, well, what law is actually going to apply to the UK? And I should put that the EU as well after Brexit. So moving on to the, the next slide there, we will have the GDPR. GDPR will still apply from an EU perspective. So we've got to look at this situation both, you know, if you've got the telescope looking from the EU into the UK, we've got the telescope looking from the UK to the EU. GDPR obviously is still going to apply from an EU perspective and it will continue to do so in the UK, but there are going to have to be some changes because if we have a hard Brexit, a no deal Brexit, the UK government have to bring in, if you like, 
bits of GDPR that weren't in there in our current act, the UK Data Protection Act. And the UK has already done that. We have the piece of legislation. Some of it already kicked in last Friday, the date we were supposed to leave, but the rest will kick in once there's a final exit from the EU. So GDPR, as I say, will still apply from the EU perspective, and it should all continue to apply from a UK perspective once those changes are made. And so moving on to the next slide, the other thing to think about is this key issue of what we call extraterritorial application. So as I just mentioned, GDPR from an EU perspective will apply if you're looking from the other 27 member states into the UK, because the UK will become a third country once it leaves the EU. So what that means is if you're a business in the UK and you're either offering goods or services or you're monitoring the behavior of individuals, and that term monitoring is a little bit ambiguous, GDPR approaches it by, by saying essentially that means sort of tracking someone on the internet, profiling, making decisions based on that about their preferences and so on. But I suspect regulators may take a wider approach to that, what that means. But if you're doing one of these two things from the UK, so you're just based in the UK and you're offering those goods or services to one of those people in the EU member states, or you're monitoring their behavior, then GDPR from an EU perspective will apply to you. So what that means is, some regulator in the, in the EU, let's say in France, if they get a complaint about a business in the UK doing something wrong in terms of offering their goods and services from the UK over the internet, for example, involving personal data, it could be that that French regulator under GDPR would act against the UK entity. Now, quite how they would do that, we will have to see. But do bear in mind that in the UK, because we're still part of the EU and because GDPR applies, the first decision we had in the UK from our regulator, the ICO, applied this extraterritorial application to Canada because of the case there concerning the big data issue. The name of the company's gone out of my head now, but it'll come back to me. Andre, Sorry? Cambridge Analytica. Was this Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica? Analytica. Thought... Thank you. I knew it was something with an yeah. Cambridge Analytica. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. although people were criticizing, thank you very much, Scott, although they were criticizing GDPR saying, well, how are they going to enforce? Well, that was an example of where a regulator has done that. So the UK will be in that position regarding the EU. And if we look at it the other way around, again, I'm turning the telescope around. Once we make our changes to the UK Data Protection Act to bring in all those other bits of GDPR, the same will apply. So let's say turning it the other way around, you're a business in France, you're offering goods and services via the internet, and there are all kinds of conditions concerning this, and you're trying to get people for this business in the UK. Let's say you had a complaint about that, something you were doing processing people's data that, that someone wasn't happy with. In theory, the UK regulator, the ICO, could act against you in France. So that's what the extraterritorial application means. And as I say, it will apply both ways, either under GDPR from the EU perspective or from the UK perspective. If I can go on to the next slide, please. So what are the actual kind of areas of data protection that people need to be worried about? Well, going on to the next slide, that, as I said before, is really the issue about data flows. And that's the real key one we need to think about. And principally, the one we need to be a little bit worried about if we get a no deal is when you have a data flow from the EU or the EEA, remember the EU and the EEA are covered by GDPR, the EEA simply being the 28 member states of the EU plus Norway, Liechtenstein and Iceland, but not Switzerland. Remember, Switzerland is a completely different case. That's the one we need to think about. But also I need to tell you a little bit about issues concerning transfers of data from the UK to the EU and the EEA. And also I need to say a few words about the lead supervisory authority, you know, that's your key regulator and the one stop mechanism, because there will be big changes there. If the UK leaves with no deal, there'll be a few things I need to say about that. So moving on to the next slide, as I indicated before, if uh, currently because the UK is in the EU, personal data can be transferred freely between all the member states. And that's because of GDPR and it's because of we had the previous regime where that also applied. But if you're going to transfer data 
from outside the EU slash EEA, you can only do that in certain ways. And many of you will be familiar with Privacy Shield, for example, in the US. Privacy Shield is an example of a way that you can do that. If you've signed up to Privacy Shield, you're able to continue to transfer that data from the EU EA out to the US. And there are other ways that can be done as well. If the UK leaves, or if and when, however you want to look at it, leaves the EU, then personal data from the EU EEA to the UK will need to be done in one of these special ways. It won't be able to be done as freely as before. And that's what I just want to say a few words about now, which is on the next slide. We have different ways that that data will be able to be transferred in the future. What we would hope for in the UK, this is assuming the UK leaves the EU and whether it's a no deal or a withdrawal of deal is approved, the European Commission for the EU, we hope what will have to make what's called an adequacy decision. What that means is the EU through the European Commission looks at a country and it looks at its whole setup concerning data protection, what rules it has, whether there are safeguards in place so that people's privacy rights are respected, can people take cases to court and so on and so on. And if the European Commission gives the green light and they say, yes, your country's okay, they make this special decision and data transfers can continue as long as various sort of norms are respected. The EU's done this with over a dozen countries. The most recent one is Japan. That was a very important one. There are lots of big countries in there but also quite a few small ones. But the Commission would have to do that for the UK. So that will be the way forward we would hope that will be the best situation. Now, if we have uh, agreement on the withdrawal deal and we have that interim period that I mentioned, probably what would happen is in that interim period, the adequacy decision would be made. And um, as I say, it would be a, the best outcome for everybody. Or you would have to use binding corporate rules to transfer data from the EU to, let's say, the UK and so on. I don't know if any of you have signed up to binding corporate rules. They are only for basically intra-company transfers. They're a kind of combination of, a, a, I always call it this, the kind of a huge privacy policy done as a contract where you get everybody on board in the business and you've got to get these approved by a regulator. And on average, it's taken about a year to get those approvals. Sometimes it's shorter. And I don't know what figure we're looking at now in the EU. It used to be around 80. I think quite a few more have been done recently. Maybe we're around 100 or so. But that's not something you do overnight. That takes quite a bit of time, planning and resource. Or what I imagine most of you are doing anyway, if you're already transferring data from out of the EU EEA to, let's say, the US, is you're using standard contractual clauses or model clauses. As you may know, this is a template document that's been done by the EU and you can't change the main clauses. Those are set in stone and you just have to add some details at the end about who the data subjects are, um, what's the type of data that you're sending and so on. They are a fairly simple procedure to, to put together because you just have to fill out those sort of bits at the end. If anything, the only problem I've, I found some clients have had is that they may have had to put in place a lot of these model clauses. And just the simple logistics of getting someone to sign them off has been quite a job. And I think that's the main thing we need to think about today. If there is one sort of major takeaway today in terms of data transfers going from the EU EEA to the UK, if we have a hard no deal Brexit at the end of next week, that's what you'll want to get in place by Friday of next week. But I'll come on to that a little bit more in a second. These other things I've got on the slide, codes of conduct certifications, we're a long way from that happening yet. And you can always try and get someone to consent to transferring that data. But I, that's a real job. That's a difficult one to do unless it's very sort of particular circumstances. So moving on to the next slide, just a few more words about adequacy. As I said, the EU has to make that decision. And what it has to say is not that EU law is your or your country's law is exactly the same as EU law, i.e. GDPR, but it has to be essentially equivalent. Now, moving on to that next slide, what the UK will start off as a position is that it'll be a kind of unprecedented point of alignment because the UK already has GDPR in place. So this should, in theory, work in the UK's favour. 
you would hope that the European Commission would say, you've got GDPR in place, so we tick all the boxes, you're good, green light and so on. However, it won't be as easy as that, I'm afraid. There are two, certainly two main obstacles to the UK getting an adequacy decision. I'm looking at the next slide. The first one is, as I said to you before, the EU has to look at not just the data protection laws, but it looks at a whole range of things. And one of the big challenge the UK will face is we have a special piece of legislation called the Investigatory Powers Act. And that's basically legislation that enables law enforcement and intelligence agencies to monitor and retain certain types of communications data, which obviously includes personal data. And it's been heavily criticized by people saying it, it doesn't really protect individuals' privacy enough. And already in the European Parliament, we've had quite a bit of noise there from politicians who are saying, you know, we're not happy with what the UK has done. We will take this into consideration when we look at and bring, uh, uh, trying to decide this adequacy decision. And I fear that is going to be a stumbling block. Whether the EU is very genuine about that or whether it's used as a kind of political weapon as well as part of any further negotiations, we'll have to see. But that will be, I think, a stumbling block. And then the second one on the next slide is the time frame. As I mentioned, many countries have got adequacy decisions, but there are also many in the queue and they take time to do. You would hope with the UK this would take this will be a quick one. As I said, if we get the withdrawal deal through Parliament, we'll have that interim period. And the hope is that it would, the adequacy decision would be done then. But if it's a no deal, you can bet your bottom dollar that the EU is not going to rush on this one. What the sort of funny thing is that you never hear is that the UK will also have to make its own adequacy decision about the EU and its <laughs> data protection regime, i.e. GDPR. So you would hope there will be some mutual interest here that the EU would want to get that decision from the UK so that data transfers can continue smoothly from the UK to the rest of the EU. And I've put here at the bottom here, unfortunately, I'm still hearing people say that the minute we, we leave the EU, the UK will get the adequacy decision straight away. That's just not going to happen. Even in the best scenario, that will take time. So as I say, Moving on to the next slide, obviously, if we have that withdrawal period, hopefully that'll be a bit of a smoother procedure, but if not, it'll take longer. So on to the next slide. So that's the first issue. The second issue, in fact, there it's really two halves of an issue, is the lead supervisory authority and the one-stop shop. Those of you who've been dealing with GDPR will know that one of the supposed benefits of GDPR is that if you have a particular problem and a regulator, a national data protection regulator in the EU, let's say Italy or Luxembourg or Spain, investigates you, the idea under GDPR is that you will only have to deal with one regulator, or as it says here, a lead regulator, the lead supervisor authority. And the benefit for you there is hopefully less bureaucracy and also in a worst case scenario, Imagine you get a fine for something imposed by a national regulator. What that would mean is that you won't get 27, 25, 15, however many other regulators looking at the same issue. You've just got that one, if you like, penalty. And so what many of you have been doing is to look at trying to identify who your lead regulator is. Now, why should you be concerned about this? Well, if you're processing data across member states, so you may have a business in the UK, there may be a branch in France or a distributor in Germany, or maybe you're just doing it from the UK or, or Germany or wherever it is, but it's having an impact on people in another member state. You're doing what's called cross-border processing of personal data. And that's why you can buy into the lead supervisory authority. Unfortunately, there's no official process for saying, this is my lead supervisor authority. That's something many of you, as you will have found, have had to do yourself. Possibly you've engaged with a regulator about this. And interestingly, there was a report published only this Monday by the European Data Protection Board, which is not a, a regulator as such, but it, it sits sort of at the top of GDPR in one sense, in that it's a, a body made up of all the national regulators. 
who deal with GDPR issues. And they published a report where they said, and this came as quite a surprise to me, that they've had 642 procedures concerning identifying a lead supervisory authority. And out of those 642 procedures, 306 have been closed and the lead supervisory authority has been identified. So people have been quite busy and active on this front. You may remember in France under the, there was a big decision recently with a big fine involved for Google, where Google had tried to argue that their lead supervisory authority was based in Ireland, where their sort of HQ is for the EU. And the French authorities rejected this. I believe this is something they may be appealing because the French said, no, that's not the case. We are the authority who's dealing with your case and so on. So under Brexit, there will no longer be a lead supervisory authority as regards the UK. What will happen is if you're based in the, or if you're doing, if you're a data controller in the UK, the ICO will be your regulator, inverted commas. But if you're still doing this other data processing, let's say between France and Germany and Luxembourg or wherever it is, you will have to identify in one of those 27 EU member states who your lead supervisory authority is. So you're going to have to do that exercise all again if you've done it once. And that kind of it might be a little bit tricky because if you've already determined that the UK is your lead supervisory authority, you've obviously got all your arguments together to say why it's the UK. And now suddenly you're having to say something a little bit different, if you like, with regard to the other 27 member states to say, well, actually, now it's in Germany. And for some of you, that may be, it may be quite a bit of tricky thinking going on there to see how you can establish that. Because as I said before, you will want to make sure that you have a lead supervisory authority in another EU member state, because you don't want to have to deal with a whole plethora of authorities. You'll just want that one that you deal with in the EU and the one that you're dealing with in the UK, the ICO, should that situation occur. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, well, that's basically what I've just said, essentially you'll have to look at that particular issue with the rest of the EU. And connected with this on the next slide is this one-stop shop, because the one-stop shop is the mechanism under which this enforcement of the lead authority system works. Because, as I said, you only want one lead regulator to deal with your issue, but that lead regulator may have to deal with other regulators. And there's a whole procedure under GDPR that deals with that, they're trying to ensure that there's consistency and cooperation between regulators and so on. And that's what's called the one-stop shop system. But moving on to the next slide, again, as you can imagine, once the UK leaves the EU, a business that's based in the UK, falling under the regime in the UK and so on, will not be able to take part under the one-stop shop enforcement mechanism with regard to the UK. That will all go. So those are two particular issues you may have to think about. But as I say, moving on to the next slide, the real key one we need to focus on is data flows, particularly if there's a no deal situation. And as I put on the next slide, we've had quite a bit of guidance, quite a few notices out from the UK, both from the UK government, but also our regulator, the ICO, that is giving advice to people about what will happen in a no deal situation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, as you can imagine, as I said, we've been quite busy with a lot of Brexit issues. And what's so frustrating with so much of it is it's very difficult to give advice in a lot of areas and to help people plan. But I think at least here with data protection and data transfers, we have a pretty good idea of what it is you have to do. And this is helped by these notices and guidance from the ICO. And as I've put on the next slide, the ICO in particular, and that's the advice you want to have a look at, and that guidance, I checked it this morning and it seemed to have even changed since last week, but it's still good stuff to look at. I'd advise you to go there. It should help you. I can't go through all the issues on this webinar, but do go there. And they've produced some FAQs as well, which are useful. Now, interestingly enough, although I've put here the six steps to take, 
if you click on the link now on the ICO website, it appears to have been taken off. But I wouldn't worry so much about that. As I say, if you look on the guidance there, just type into Google something like ICO, Brexit guidance, data transfers guidance, something like that, you'll find that. And the main recommended steps that they recommend are as follows. So moving on to the next slide. The easy bit is data transfers from the UK to the EU stroke EEA. I repeat again, looking through that telescope, you're, you're sending all the pipeline, whatever it is you want to call it, you're sending personal data from the UK to what will be the other 27 member states plus the three EEA states, the extra ones. And what the UK is saying is, don't panic, stay calm, the status quo should continue, at least for now. So what the UK is saying, and they're sending out clear sort of policy messages and so on, is that things should continue as they are now, even if we have a no deal, so that if you're making those transfers, everything should be okay. In particular, because what the UK is doing is they're saying, you know, we're not concerned about the EU, so you can continue to make those transfers. But also what the UK is saying is if you're going to make those transfers to non-EU or EEA countries, so let's say you're making a transfer to South America, to Africa, to Asia, or whatever it is, we in the UK will mirror what the EU has concerning its rules. So for example, as I mentioned, the adequacy decisions. So as I said, we have a, an adequacy decision now from the EU concerning Japan. What the UK is saying is they will mirror that. So that if you're transferring personal data from the UK to Japan, they're saying we, in effect, are giving our blessing to the EU-Japan decision. You're fine. We follow what they've done. And similarly, the UK is saying the same will apply for model clauses and binding corporate rules. The UK is also doing that regarding the US Privacy Shield program. So all's good and well in theory. <laughs> There's always a but, isn't there? The UK still has to put in place some little bits of legislation and agreements with these countries to make sure that's all OK. So do be careful you don't get tripped up on. And for example, if you're looking at the US Privacy Shield program, I strongly suggest that you go on to the US website because it gives you a little bit of our advice there saying if there is a no deal with the UK, you can continue with Privacy Shield, but you're going to have to make a slight upgrade to your commitments, you're going to have to set to say we continue our commitments that we've previously made with regard now to the UK and the no deal situation. And you're probably going to have to make a little change to your privacy policy. And they very usefully provide a kind of template, very short little clause that you can use there. So as I say, the situation in theory is good for UK transfers to the EU EEA and UK transfers to those other places that are currently recognized by the EU under these various arrangements. But as they make sure, you know, as always, check the small print and make sure that you've got everything in place, like these little changes you may need to make concerning the privacy shield. Moving on to the next slide. The other way around, though, is a bit different. So if you've got personal data transfers going from the EU slash EEA to the UK, this is where you have to do something in particular if we have this no deal by next week, the 12th of April, because as I mentioned before, the UK will become a third country as regards the EU perspective, GDPR, sort of we've left GDPR and all that. So it means that you've got to put in place one of these safeguards to make sure you can continue to send personal data. I mentioned binding corporate rules, but as I say, those are not done overnight and they're only for intra-company data transfers. So the, the one that's the most likely that you can all apply will be model clauses. Those are very easily found. If you're looking for those templates, as I said, you can't change the basic clauses. You just have to add in a little bit of detail at the end in the appendixes about who, you, about who the subjects are, what the data is, and your security measures and so on. And as I say, although they're not, for those of you who've dealt with them, you'll know that they're not too tricky to handle in themselves. It's more the logistics of getting them all signed off and so on. Now, the ICO has also produced a very useful little interactive tool that I recommend you have a look at. 
if you want to go through this in a bit more detail about those data transfers from the EU EEA to the UK. It just takes about 10 minutes to go through. It's a very good little, I think, step by step. What do I need to worry about? What do I need to do issue type thing? Again, if you just go into Google and you just sort of type ICO interactive tool about data transfers, you should find it very easily. I do recommend you have a look at that. So moving on to the next slide, just as the ICO guidance also says, what I've already said before, you're going to have to change things regarding lead supervisory authority and one stop shop and so on. You're going to have to look at that. And similarly, as I said, you're going to have to have this issue about extraterritoriality that may come up. But there, what I haven't mentioned so far is that you're going to have to appoint a data protection representative. What does that mean? Well, currently under the GDPR, let's say you're in the US, you're either offering goods and services to people, let's say in Italy or wherever it is, or UK, and you, but you've got no operations out in those countries, you're just doing all this through your website, or as I mentioned, you're monitoring the behavior of people, online tracking and so on, then you're supposed to already appoint what's called a data protection representative in the EU EEA. That person is supposed to interface with the relevant data protection regulator concerning any issues regarding data protection. It can be an individual, it can be a company, you could even do it within someone else's, or you could outsource it, for example. Basically, it's a sort of service agreement where you're getting someone to, to be your representative. Now, from the Brexit perspective, because the UK will be outside the EU, if you are a company in the UK monitoring people's behavior or selling goods and services and so on into the EU EEA, you will have to appoint a data protection representative in the EU EEA. And similarly, when we change our rules, as I mentioned before, to incorporate the rest of GDPR into the UK rules, you'll have to do the same the other way around. So again, if you're in France, and you've got this website where you're offering goods and services to people in the UK and certain conditions apply, it's not as simple as having a website, then you will in theory have to appoint that representative in the UK for, to represent your interests from France. So next slide. As I said that, oh, this is just a bit more about the, the data protection representative, but I need to make it clear, this is not the same as a DPO. Your representative cannot be your DPO. It has to be someone who's different. They are two completely different roles, two completely different tasks. So don't confuse those two. These are two different things. And I should add, as I've mentioned DPOs, that really not much changes concerning data protection officers because we have the same rules under, in the UK as under GDPR, prescribing certain situations when you have to have a data protection officer or not. What could be different, of course, is that let's say you have a multinational organization that's in the UK, Italy, France, Germany, and so on, and whether you could have one single DPO, both under the UK rules and under GDPR and the, the, those other 27 member states. I think that should be possible, but for some people, the jury's still a little bit out on that one. So next slide, and I appreciate I need to move on a little bit. Don't forget also that if we're gonna have that no deal, you may need to make a few other little changes to some of your other documents, like for example, your privacy policy, maybe a data protection impact assessment, if you've done those, just to tweak that a little bit concerning Brexit. So don't forget those things out. So it should be smaller changes, but, but they could be important too. And then obviously you need to make people aware in your organization that um, of what you're doing and that your plans are up to date. And if you've got a risk register, and that's it will be a good idea to update that as well. Moving on to the next slide then, just some very, very quick takeaways and onto the next slide after that. What are the takeaways for a no deal situation? Have a plan B, as I say. <laughs> we may have only until Friday of next week to do this. Be proactive about it. Don't leave it to the last minute. You know, if you've got that organization that you're dealing with in Germany or France or whatever, that's sending you personal data in the UK, and so on, you really need to be approaching them and saying, you know, what are you doing, guys? We need to sort this out. As I said, point number three there, look at how you can sort out those data transfers. As I say, the most likely candidate for all of you is going to be model clauses. But in the long term, you might want to think about doing these 
binding corporate rules. I know a lot of more people are looking about at those. And as I said in point four, be careful on the logistics. It may need a bit of time to sort out those model clauses. And as I said in point five there, you may need to tweak a few other things like your privacy policies and so on. Moving on to my next two topics. The second one is quite a quick one. Scott thought it'd be a good idea that I said a few things about e-privacy. You probably know these e-privacy rules, but are not aware of them because you will have been dealing with issues concerning marketing, sending out marketing emails and also cookies. That's basically what these rules deal with. They are originally EU rules in the form of a directive, as I've underlined there. And what the EU member states have done, including the UK, is they've simply implemented those rules into their law. So the rules we have in the UK at the moment concerning e-privacy rules about marketing and uh, cookies and so on, they're already there in the UK. Those are not going to change the Brexit. And as I've mentioned in the second bullet point there, although they're aimed at electronic communication services, as if you're doing marketing by email and so on and cookies, they all concern you. But there are particular rules for things like telecoms providers and so on. And there's a whole separate regime about notifying to a regulator a security breach and so on. And moving on to the next slide, basically what those rules do is they're trying to harmonize throughout the EU all kinds of issues. But particularly the key one is marketing here. So you may be saying, well, hang on a minute. Last year under GDPR, we had to do all kinds of stuff about marketing. What's the difference here? Well, these rules, the privacy rules, set down the basic issues about marketing, that you have to have consent and so on if you're going to send people marketing material. The issue that happened with GDPR is that you may recall GDPR basically recalibrated the consent requirements. So it's a kind of crossover, if you like, between the two sets of rules that GDPR was simply saying, now this is the standard for consent that you have to apply regarding things like the e-privacy rules. Moving on to the next slide, what is happening though, and that is important for you to realize, uh, oh, I've already mentioned here, sorry, that the it concerns marketing and cookies, and if I could just move on to the next slide, sorry. What is important for you to understand though, is that we're going to have new rules on e-privacy in the form of a regulation, just like GDPR is in the form of a regulation. And a regulation is automatically binding in, in all the member states. And we were supposed to have an upgrade of those e-privacy rules to come into place the same time as GDPR on the 25th of May last year, but it didn't happen. Although the new rules to upgrade e-privacy were actually not particularly long, there's certainly nothing like GDPR, it's met with a lot of problems in the EU legislative pipeline. As I put there in the second bullet point, the idea is to sort of expand a little bit the scope of who it applies to and things like that. And moving on to the next slide, also there are other things like consent that they look at. And they're trying to streamline rules about cookies. What they're also trying to do is align those rules with GDPR. And the sort of sting in the tail though, is that any infringements of those e-privacy rules will be at the same sort of level of fines, all those horror stories you've heard about being the same level as 20 million euros or 4% of annual global turnover and so on. But moving on to the next slide, as I said, although the idea was to have privacy rules in line with GDPR, it's still ongoing. And the latest update, I had a look again the other day, it's still all delayed. What's interesting though, I saw looking again at some of the language I put there in, in the second bullet point, is they the, the politicians actually seem to have some sympathies with people under GDPR because they're saying, you know, people are suffering from consent fatigue. So there's still a little bit of discussion there going on. And moving on to the next slide, we don't know at what point these new rules will come into place, but we have European Parliament elections coming up this May. We will have a new European Commission in place at the end of this year. So it's very likely that we're not going to have these rules agreed until the end of this year, 2019. And the latest draft that I've seen said that 
even if that were to occur, that the rules won't apply until almost two years after that. So we're not looking at at least until the end of 2021 before those rules come into place. Now, where does this tie in with our with my presentation today? Well, in the Brexit context, probably if it does all happen, the UK will have completely left the EU by that stage. And so these new rules will not apply to the UK unless the UK decides to voluntarily align with them. Or this is something that I think people don't always remember, that whatever we're going to do in our future relationship with the EU, we're going to still in some way have to sort of keep in line with them in terms of having to want to do business with the EU. That's a big generalization. But I think things like this, the UK may simply you know, find it has to adopt these rules in any event in order to keep up to speed or to keep in line with the EU, whatever, however you want to talk it. And I'm being quite diplomatic here. So I wouldn't be surprised, what I'm trying to say, is if these rules did all come into place in the UK at some future date. But let's see. So the final bit, which I'm going to have to race through a little bit to give us enough time to ask questions, are the cybersecurity rules. Now, you may have heard about these. In 2016, the EU introduced these special rules, which I'm going to shorten in short firm <laughs> paraphrases, just call them the NIS rules, NIS, Network and Information Systems. Basically, they're aimed at two groups of organizations. So they don't apply to everybody like GDPR does. They're basically two groups, what are called operators of essential services, OESs, and relevant digital service providers, RDSPs. And they basically impose two sets of obligations on these two categories. Firstly, you have to have appropriate cyber security measures in place. And secondly, you have to report cyber security incidents to a regulator. So moving on to the next slide, how would I know if I'm affected by these rules? Well, interestingly enough, because I deal with, with me and my colleague, we deal with a lot of data breaches. Very often, one of our first questions amongst our checklist of things that we say to people is, have you thought about the NIST rules? People, are, I think, are not aware of these rules. They came into place almost at the same time as GDPR, just a little bit before, and they seem to have been a bit ignored. So the first question is you may say to yourself, well, what's an OES? Well, basically, these are the sort of the big guys, if you like, that are doing things to maintain critical society and economic activities. So going on to the next slide, those are things like the energy business, transport, healthcare, water supply, and digital infrastructure. And we have detailed rules within the NIST rules to say, if you meet these conditions, you fall under the NIST rules. So it's not every single electricity business or every single drinking water supplier or domain name registry that it applies to. There are certain criteria that you have to look on to see whether you fall under them. So even there, you might be limited. They may not apply to you. And moving on to the next slide, the regulators in this, even if you might think they don't apply to you, they could actually decide that you do. So there is still a possibility there that you might get caught out if they thought you would fall under the, the, the rules. And as I say, the key thing they're, they're concerned about is where there may be some kind of cyber security incident. And just as an aside here, you may have been saying to yourself, well, where were financial services and banking in that? Well, the UK has not included those simply because the UK had already put in special rules concerning the banking and financial sectors and cybersecurity. That's already been up and running well before the NIST rules. So next slide, please. There we have these other types of organizations, these RDSPs, that's an online marketplace, a search engine or a cloud computing service. So those are the other areas of types of businesses and organizations that can be affected. But I, there's a little sting in the tail that I'll come to at the end here. So don't just switch off now and think, well, it doesn't affect me. I don't fall into one of those categories. Looking at the next slide, what is it that you have to do? Oh, sorry, yes, I, I should have mentioned that you were supposed to have notified yourself to a regulator last year by the 10th of August 2018 if you were an OES and you were supposed to have notified the ICO if you were an RDSP by the 1st of November. And there can be sanctions if you haven't done that already. 
Moving on to the next slide. What do I have to do? Again, onto the next slide. Well, as I mentioned, you've basically got to put in place uh, proper cyber security measures. These are phrased in quite broad terms, as I put here the quote here, basically appropriate and proportional technical and organizational measures, and it has to be state of the art, and so on and so on. Moving on to the next slide, there's a little bit more about that. Again, these are phrased in broad terms, but also, as I've put in the second bullet point there, you have to look at the relevant regulatory guidance because the regulators have issued guidance on this, on what it is you, you have to do. So there's a bit more detail there that will help you rather than this sort of broad sweeping language. Now, you may be saying to yourself, aha, this sounds like GDPR. Now, it's true that there is a little bit of a crossover here. And I've had to deal with a few questions from people where they said, that we comply with GDPR and the security measures. We have doing this, we do that, and so on to keep data secure. Does that mean the same applies under the cybersecurity rules concerning cyber incidents? And our answer has been, you're probably on the right path, but you're unlikely to be covering everything. And we have had people kind of do comparison tables where they've put in all their various control systems uh, how they're dealing with with data breaches and so on under GDPR, you know, encryption and all those kind of firewalls and secure premises and all that kind of stuff, and saying, right, what is it more that we have to do under the NIS rules? And as I say, I've often found that there is still a little bit more work to do, in some cases, quite a bit more. So don't assume that it's the same as GDPR, but as I say, if you put that all in place under GDPR, you are in a better place. So moving on we have a, a an organization in the uk called the national cyber security center it's not actually a regulator but it has issued sector neutral guidance that you can find at that website that i put there that will help you deal with some of these cyber security issues so that is probably your first port of call in terms of looking at what you have to do in terms of cyber security requirements and the next slide we have also very similar requirements if you're one of these RDSPs. We can move on again to the next slide. They're very similar, but there are some differences between the two. Again, it's you know having the state of the art security, you know, looking at the risks and putting in things that are proportionate. You know, they're not asking you to boil the ocean. It's you know what is tailored to your business and making sure that you can deal with you know the, the continuity of those services. Moving on to the next bit. As I said, the second thing is you have to report an incident to a regulator. It's a slightly different definition for the OES and the RDSPs, but basically for the OESs, you have to report something that has a significant impact on the continuity of that service. And with the RDSP, it's an incident having a substantial impact on your digital services. So it's rather broadly phrased. I'm not aware, at least in the UK, of any incidents that may have been reported as having been publicly reported, if you like. So we still don't really know to what degree you might fit into these rules. You know, what's the significant impact? A little bit of finger in the air stuff and so on. So we're going to have to see how that, that pans out. And moving on to the next slide, you have to report those incidents just like with GDPR within the 72 hour time frame, uh, some similarities there again with GDPR and going on to the next slide, there are various forms you can fill out that, that tell you very clearly and the rules tell you very clearly what you have to report, you know, who are you, how many people were affected, how long did this last and so on. It's not a big form to complete. You can turn this around very quickly if you have to. And so the question then is, well, who's my regulator on the next slide? Moving on to the next one after that. Well, this is where it gets slightly confusing because we don't have a central regulator in the UK for the NIST regime. What they've done is they've adopted a sectoral approach. So you've got a different range of regulators. And this relates in the UK to the various government departments. So, for example, the ministry that deals with transport or the one that deals with healthcare, they will be the regulator under NIS for 
that particular organization. And as I mentioned before, for these digital service providers, it's the ICO that is the regulator. Now, to be honest, I've looked at NIS issues and I, if I've known that I have a client or someone who's dealing, who's an, a digital service provider, we go straight to the ICO website. They've got a form there. We know what to do. But to be honest, I've, issues have come up with some of the other regulators and I've had a job trying to find on some of their websites how you notify and who you do it through and so on or who do you pick up the phone to speak to so if you are regulated under NIS and you are one of those OESs you do need to do your homework say so I think the UK is a little bit or at least as far as I can see perhaps slightly behind on that in making it a little bit more user friendly so moving towards the end of this bit on to the next slides are there any sanctions Yes, there are on the next slide. We've got basically four categories of sanctions. They're not as horrible as GDPR, but they are nevertheless potentially quite high. So if it's something that's not a security incident, so it's something that you haven't done that infringes the other bits of the rules, you can still get a fine of up to one UK million pounds. But then they've got three categories for when you have a cyber security incident in terms of the fine that you could get. The lowest one is 3.4 million UK pounds, where you have an incident that has caused or could cause a something reducing the service provision for a significant period of time. And then on the next slide, it starts to go up. If you've done something more serious, where it it's results in a disruption of the service for a significant period of time, that's a higher fine of 8.5 million. And then we get to the top end of the scale with the next one, 17 million UK pounds. That's the really serious stuff where it's got a threat to life or significant adverse impact on the UK economy. Let's hope that never happens. So those are the sort of possible sanctions you could be facing. And just moving on towards the end, I think we'll skip that next slide and go on to the last bit about is there any overlap with this and GDPR? Moving on again. Well, as you know, GDPR is fully up and running, and it may be that some of you who have had to deal with data breaches, I hope not, but I imagine some of you may have had to do that, and you may have had to notify them to the ICO. Now, it's possible that if you fall under the NIS rules as well, that you're going to be a data controller under GDPR because your cybersecurity incident may involve personal data. So the issue there is, well, hang on a minute. Does that mean I have to report under NIS and under GDPR? Well, there is obviously a risk of double jeopardy. And although the UK's policy is that they're going to try and avoid that, this might not happen. It may end up that you do have to report to the two or you're going to have to present good arguments to explain why it is you're only reporting to the one. And I would say this, wouldn't I? But you should really seek uh, expert legal counsel on this. And I know, as I say, I've already had to deal with a couple of these issues because we're still quite new under the NIS regime. These issues aren't always so, so clear. So uh, how can I prepare for things in terms of cybersecurity and will they be affected by Brexit? Well, in terms of preparing, as I say, you've got to determine first if you're one of these two types of organization that falls under the rules. If you are, you need to look at what cybersecurity measures you've got in place. There's that particular guidance I referred to that you can look at. You need to update or set up your incident plans and procedures. You might want to sort of tie those up with what you've already got for GDPR data breach reporting. That would be quite a neat way of dealing with it. And like we always say this about any incident or data breach handling, make sure you, you fire drill those. That's really important because when they happen, and you've got this horrible 72 hours, as some of you may already know, you've really got to turn things around fast. And guess what? They always happen on a Friday afternoon. I'm not kidding you. Most of the data breach incidents I've had to deal with my colleague, they have happened on a Friday, or at least we've been told about them on a Friday. So you've got stuff to do over the weekend because the regulator doesn't sleep. The clock doesn't stop, as it were. Just moving on to that, the next slide then, just trying to wrap up here, and I hope we still have time for questions. Obviously, you need to tell your, your board about the NIST regime if they don't know about it. You've got all those usual compliance things to do, like training, training, training. 
and you may need to look at public relations because if you've got an incident that is affecting a lot of people, you're obviously going to have to communicate that to people in terms of your sort of publicity. And last but not least, look at your cyber insurance. Those of you in the US who are listening, I think you're in a better place dealing with cyber insurance. You have a far more developed market. And I'm, I'm sorry, I hope don't insult anybody in the UK who's dealing with cyber insurance. There are lots of good policies out there, but I think we're still all doing a little bit of catch up here in terms of, of those issues. So this is my little sting in the tail, as I said at the end about security, cyber security issues. You may be saying, well, OK, I'm glad he's told us all about that. It doesn't apply to me. I'm not an OES. I'm not an RDSP. But you may be in their supply chain. And although the NIST regime doesn't apply directly to supply chains, what we're already seeing is these OESs and the RDSPs have been revising their contracts to make sure that their suppliers tell them if something has happened that might require those organizations to report to a regulator. And when we have a data protection incident, we're always saying to people as well, look in your contracts. It may be that something's been revised or that you have to now inform your supplier so that they can go on and report to their regulator, or at least so that they can make a decision about that. Now, with these NIST rules, well, Brexit doesn't actually change anything. There may be a few little tweaks here and there in the UK legislation to make, but it doesn't change anything. It's still going to be there. Andre, uh, forgive me. Forgive me for cutting cutting off. We are at the yes. top of the hour here. Oh, and we just we are. Made... Okay. Well, a couple things. One, I know that many of you had questions that didn't get answered in this hour. Please continue to send in your questions because we're going to put them on the Spring blog uh, in about a week. And also, yes, this slide deck will made, be made available to you in about a week as well. And finally, I will be coming out to visit Andre you know, on May 29th. So um, if you are in the neighborhood, we'd love to, to uh, come and see you there. There will be more about that soon. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, U.S. data protection and how it applies to the U.K. So with that, sorry, Andrew, we've we got to go. But thank you very, very much for joining us. This has been just, just a joyful hour. I've learned a lot. And um, hopefully we will um, get to see you again with us on another uh, future webinar. And again, I'm sorry we couldn't answer questions on the web. And again, thank you, Scott. But we will deal with those, uh, as you say, appropriately through the right channels. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you and thanks everyone for attending the webinar. We're very grateful.